Strategies for Real Estate, a 30-minute program updating you on today's real estate market and discussing current issues and opportunities in the desirable Silicon Valley. Plus, interviews with real estate experts giving you insight on what's to come. With your host, Dan Lawson. And now, Strategies for Real Estate. Hello and welcome to our, our Real Estate Climate segment. It's now my pleasure to introduce Kelly Hunt, a familiar face to Strategies for Real Estate. It's nice to be back again. It's nice to have you. It's Thank always you. always a pleasure. So, um, so it's a seller's market, yeah? Still. Still. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> why don't we talk about inventories? What, what is the story with inventory? Well, you know, as you know, the last couple of years, the inventory has been historically low, and that's only continued uh, to this year. In fact, I was looking at my notes from a segment that we had done back in early 2012, and it's pretty much the same conditions now as it was then, only even less inventory. And I think the demand is even greater now because we have a lot of people moving back into the area with the jobs. So it's it's not. The job very market fun. is very strong. It's very strong. Yeah, well, I mean, we recovered here well before the rest of the nation. So we're uh, seeing a lot of that with the housing market. So what, what's the overall market impact for sellers? What? It's got to be a very friendly one for them. Well, for sellers, yes, um, obviously. So for buyers, it's not so friendly. But um, there were a lot of people, I think, for many years that were underwater. And so because of the appreciation that we've seen over the past two years, um, actually the past three years, a lot of those uh, people who have been sitting and waiting are in a position to actually sell their home because they're not upside down if they want to get out of the area. But um, if they're planning on staying here, uh, I think part of what's happening is people are afraid to put their house on the market, whether it's to get a larger home or to downsize, because they're afraid they're not going to have a place to go because the inventory is so low. So it's, it's creating a little bit of a predicament for the sellers, though, as well, because they want to move to a new place. But if they put their house on the market, it's going to be difficult getting into another place. And, and more and more, I'm seeing people retaining their home while they're mm -hmm. buying another one, and then they put it on the market. Exactly, which and is a little bit of a risky venture. But with the way the market is right now, they're probably you know, more likely to get away with something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or at least end up in a, in a nice position. Right. And you have to, of course, as you know, you have to be able to qualify. Right. right. So now you've got a seller who's trying to buy another piece of property and still qualify for two mortgage payments to buy that house. There, there are inherent problems with that strategy. Yes, definitely. there are. You know, but again, it's, 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 so what do you say to your, your sellers or the potential sellers when you're meeting with them? And whether it's a single person, couple, what have you, they're, they're thinking, well, if we do put our house on a market, our neighbor just sold in, in a, within a week. Right. So what, what are some of the strategies you you put in play to help people maybe feel a bit more comfortable, maybe extended escrows or some right. of these other things? Yeah, so typically what I try to do is to prepare them for the next leg because that's really what they have to look at is how long is it going to take to get into the next property. Um, so I have, for example, have a young couple, they're selling their condo and so we were able to get them into contract but what we did is we negotiated a little bit longer close and a 45 day rent back. But it's always good for sellers to have a backup plan. If they have family in the area, if they've already got most of their stuff in storage because they've prepared their home to sell it, right. um, just to have a good backup plan just in case. But getting a rent back is ideally what you want to do, but it's good to have a backup plan just in case. Always have a contingent plan. Exactly. It, it's, it, it helps you sleep a little better. It now. does. It's still nerve wracking. It's different when you're buying your first home and you're renting, you just give your notice and then you move in. But when you're trying to do two transactions simultaneously, it adds a, another layer of stress. Of angst. Yeah, basically. Yeah, stress, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, I think this is an appropriate time to, to trend or at least move to the conversation about buyers in mm -hmm. this market. Well, as you know, it's been very difficult. I'm sure <coughs> you're working with borrowers that are, you know, been looking for some time and keep coming to you to get pre-approval letters for the next offer that they're writing. So it's been somewhat difficult, but I think it's really important that buyers interview their agents really well because I've seen offers from buyers and they've written really good prices and in some cases terms, but their agent isn't really presenting them in the best light possible. They're not really providing all the documentation. Like I like to make sure that my buyers have provided all the documentation we need to provide proof of funds to close. Are they formally pre-approved? Is that lender willing to talk to the listing agent and assure them that they're going to get the, uh, the job done right. in the right amount of time? The other problem that buyers run into though is the appraisal. 
So I think what's happening now is a lot of agents are talking their buyers into not having uh, any sort of contingencies, let alone an appraisal contingency. Um, I understand it's a very um, difficult market and you want to do what you can to get in, but you also want to protect yourself. Um, so one of the things I've been doing with my buyers is I try to take a look at the comps and what we feel like the last sales are going to support on an appraisal. Um, but you know that you have to offer more than that in order to get into a home nowadays. So what I've been trying to do is to talk to listing agents about allowing us to have a, an appraisal contingency where, let's say the offer price is 850, but we only need it to appraise for 780. You know, then it then we're still with 20% down, and we have the wherewithal in order to bring cash right. to the table to make the difference. So whatever you can do to make that offer more palatable and still keep whatever contingencies that will protect you, to me that's the ideal thing. So I, I just think it's important for buyers to really discuss all of this with their agents when, when they're writing offers. And, and as you say, you pointed to a very important point, and that's working with someone who's experienced and understands a lot of the nuances about right. how to move from being a potential buyer to being someone in contract. Right is one having the respect in the community mm -hmm. certainly as you mentioned go over all the details right. ahead of time so you so the person isn't nervous or concerned they right. understand we talked about contingencies about a seller if they if they can't find a house once right. they've sold yeah. well there's a number of contingencies that when we work together those times that we do we like to help the client see, well, these are different options. This is how you can do things. Appraisal contingency is one. Right. And impact if it does, if it's, does if it doesn't come in at value. Yeah. yeah. What, what does that mean? And do you have the resources? And if you do, you can, you can certainly offer the seller that comfort because the seller's right. looking for certainty and security themselves. Correct. And obviously, you know, from a seller's perspective, to have no contingencies, you know, they feel a lot more comfortable with that. Personally, I think it's important for a seller to allow a buyer to have some sort of contingency because it protects everybody. Um, right. I think later down the road when the market kind of nor gets to more of a normal market, um, sometimes you will see buyers will start to step up and say that they didn't have the opportunity to do their due diligence and they, they were told that they couldn't have any contingencies in order to purchase that home. And so I just think it really opens everybody up for a potential lawsuit to not at least allow the buyers to have some, even if it's a three-day contingency. I know in many cases we have reports and inspections done before we go on the market, but you still want to allow the buyer time to go in and find out what's it going to cost to do those things if they're going to take that house as is, things like that. Exactly. Now we've been talking about um, some of the different ways a, a buyer can present themselves mm -hmm. in a more favorable light. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some other thoughts you have? Well, with first time home buyers, a lot of times they have little down payment and so they tend to kind of get squeezed out from those other buyers um, that have 20, 30, 40, 50 percent down or all cash. Um, I've talked to buyers about trying to at least make sure that they can get into a conventional loan as opposed to an FHA. When you bring FHA to the table, as you know, there's a few other layers of conditions that are going to come into play and a listing agent and a seller may decide that they don't want to deal with the potential uh, added things they'd have to do as a result of an FHA buyer. So if a buyer is going to be putting 3.5% down, but they have a 401k, they may want to consider pulling some money from their 401k so they can put 5 or 10% down and get into a conventional loan as opposed to an FHA loan. You're still borrowing the, the majority, of, the same amount of money, but you're borrowing it from yourself, but your down payment is larger in the eyes of a seller. So I right. think that's something that kind of at least puts them in a better position when it comes to financing. It, it, it is another strategy and another, mm -hmm. another option. Right. And we talk about contingent plans. You know, it's it may be that someone says, well, I don't really want to pull my money from my 401k, right. but if I have to, I will. Right. And, and then you're borrowing. And then, then you counsel with your lender to say, can you get me approved in both categories? Exactly. And we do to give you those flexible points. Right. Exactly. And you're paying yourself back. You know, you're not paying taxes on that money. You're going to pay yourself back if you're borrowing it from your 401k. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. There's, there's no penalty or anything negative like that. Exactly. Um, so... What are your thoughts? Buy now? Sell now? What, what, do you, what do you say? I still think that people should buy now. Um, the interest rates are incredible right now. I mean, you and I have been in the industry long enough to know when they were 14 percent, let alone mm -hmm. where they are now. Uh, so I, I think there's still an advantage to buyers to get in now, especially since we still seem to be on an upward trend as far as values are concerned. Right. For sellers, if there's a goal they're trying to accomplish, they should sell. Whether it's to move out of the area, whether it's to downsize, now is still time to do it because now you lock in your tax base. When you make that next purchase, you're locking in that tax base now before yeah, the values there are go a lot higher. Of, there are a number of advantages. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we, we, you just mentioned something and, I, and I, it begs the question because there's a lot of talk now about 
the bubble. And right. Is there a bubble? Right. And and I have my own thoughts. I'm interested in hearing yours. Well, I think what we're going through now is a lot different than what we experienced in 2004, 5, 6, before the market started to really change. And that is... It's like daylight, sunlight. It's Yeah, it's, it's way different. I mean, people have been putting money down. Qualifying, as you know, is very difficult. So people actually have to make income in order to get into a home to buy a house right now. So there's equity being established from the get-go. Where back then, we had all these loans where people didn't have to put any money down, they didn't have to prove their income, they got really low credit scores. Values I mean, it were was escalated because of a, a very friendly, over-exuberant lending Right, climate. I mean, people were getting loans that really didn't qualify, and that's not the case right now. So, and there's a lot of jobs in this area, so I think that mm. that's going to stimulate the uh, housing market. And back in the early 2000s, people really didn't care. They said, well, I'm going right. to sell in two years anyway, and I'll make 100000 Right. It really wasn't a thought of, well, I'm going to live in a house to be part of a community or a neighborhood right. or, or something like that. Correct. And, and the, I seldom see somebody say, well, I just, I just want to make a couple hundred K as Correct. quickly as I can. Yeah, most people now want to have a house to live in, and they want to be there for a while. Correct. Well, Kelly, as always, thanks so much for your feedback, your, your comments, and, and opinions. I, I, I appreciate do. you asking me back. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> we'll have you on again real soon. Sounds good. All right.